Well, my name is Castron Aruzzi. I am the head of hardware uh, at the Advanced Quantum Testbed at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, so today we're going to give you an overview of uh, what the AQT is, uh, including the technical aspects and the user program. Um, so we are one of two U.S. Department of Energy uh, quantum test beds. Our sister test bed is QScout at Sandia National Labs. It's a trapped ion platform. Um, so check them out. But we are the, the superconducting platform. Uh, we develop and operate a full stack uh, superconducting quantum uh, computing platform with a growing number of uh, quantum processors, uh, cryogenic platform development in partnership with uh, BlackSimo, which is a startup here in Berkeley. Uh, we work on room temperature uh, controlled electronics, both in-house developed at LBL, uh, which is open sourced, and then also commercial solutions uh, by Zurich Instruments and others. Uh, and we also work on the software stack and uh, collaborate with others at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to develop tools and uh, deploy them to optimize circuits and mitigate errors. And uh, this platform is then made available to users from uh, across academia, national labs, and industry. And uh, over the last uh, two, three years, when we have had an open call for proposals, we've had uh, really a mix of all of these entities that we've uh, collaboratively run experiments with. Um, on the industrial side, uh, two particular users were from Quantum Benchmark and Supertech, which uh, upon demonstrating their, uh, their uh, experiments and products here at AQT were then uh, acquired by Keysight and Cold Quanta uh, over the last year or so. Uh, the 2022 call for proposals uh, is open now uh, and everyone can apply at aqt.lbl.gov. Uh, it's official, we're officially past the, the deadline uh, for the once a year, the annual call, but we do accept proposals on a rolling basis. So uh, this is what the full stack uh, looks like. Roughly speaking, uh, we have, of course, all of the cryogenics, the dilution fridge to cool down uh, the uh, processors to 10 millikelvin. Uh, we have the room temperature electronics uh, here, the two versions that I spoke about, and uh, the, the quantum processors. Um, and then, of course, a multidisciplinary team here at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and our collaborators. So it starts with the, the quantum processor. Uh, we have a number of these, the, really the bread and butter, uh, the workhorse that we use for running experiments right now is a transmon-based uh, quantum processor. Uh, we're now in version six or seven uh, of the Trailblazer chip. Um, this is roughly what it looks like. So this, there are basically eight transmons in, packed in a ring geometry. The transmons here are in uh, green. They're coupled. Uh, they're, they're all fixed frequency qubits. They're coupled through fixed resonators in uh, purple and uh, driven individually through the lines, the control lines here in blue. Um, and uh, they are coupled to a common readout bus uh, through these resonators in uh, red. So readout is done uh, in reflection in, in multiplexed. Um, and uh, so this is uh, what we've been using. We have a number of other, uh, well, we have a, a few different types of um, uh, Fubit implementations under development, including uh, Flexonium and, and more. Um, and also we have other uh, architectures for quantum processors also under development. The uh, Trailblazer chip, uh, so these are, uh, this is a bit more specifications for those who are interested. Uh, details on coherence times, uh, frequencies, uh, fidelities, um, and uh, gate development also. Uh, particularly, we were uh, pretty much the only uh, facility where you can find a native uh, ITOFLE gate. Um, and uh, the, the standard two qubit gate that we use is, is the CZ gate. Uh, we've also implemented uh, QTRIT experiments on this chip as well. So we have access to larger, uh, larger uh, Hilbert spaces. So this is where we fall on uh, the coherence plot. Uh, this is uh, the coherence data averaged uh, among all of the different qubits um, and uh, is representative uh, of our devices above 100 microseconds each. Um, and uh, it, the, the plot is slightly out of date now over the last year or so. IBM has uh, rolled out another processor that is somewhere to the top right of the plot here above 150 uh, microseconds. 
but other than that, it's, it's relatively, uh, relatively, relatively up to date. Then we have the cryogenic platform. So uh, between the campus side of uh, efforts at the quantum nanoelectronics lab and uh, the AQT, we have access to seven or eight cryostats. This is the largest one, uh, which we affectionately refer to as uh, Blizzard. Uh, it has 160 uh, microwave drive lines, uh, microwave lines, 16 of them are superconducting for readout. Uh, under the base plate is an experimental stage, as you see here on the top right. Uh, this allows us to compartmentalize the experimental space so that we can, uh, you know, really partition and use it for multiple experiments at once. So at any given point, we have uh, two to three different uh, trailblazer chips uh, available for experiments, but also a number of uh, more novel architectures. And uh, then for the development of this cryo stage and the, the cryo packaging that houses and thermalizes the chip, uh, we collaborate with uh, Pleximo, which is the startup I mentioned about um, earlier. Um, and some more uh, details and, and pictures uh, of, of the same platform. For the controlled hardware, we have two solutions on the industrial side. Uh, our industrial partner here is Zurich Instruments. Uh, we have a number of these boxes. That, the, so these are all FPGA-based uh, control electronics. Uh, that generate the RF pulses to control uh, the qubits and do readout. Um, and so we've worked closely with Zurich Instruments to uh, develop uh, firmware features that would basically place us at the cutting edge of solutions available so that we can run uh, experiments efficiently. And uh, we're now working with them on, uh, on more modern feedback schemes to enable uh, more sophisticated experiments that our users are, are demanding. Um, and so that is the standard hardware for the users, but in addition to that, uh, we also have been working uh, a portion of our team at the Advanced Technology, uh, at the Accelerator Technologies and Applied Physics Division at Berkeley Lab. Uh, we've been working with them to develop an in-house FPGA-based solution, uh, which we refer to as uh, Cubic, uh, standing for Qubit Control. Uh, so this allows us more flexibility in terms of uh, uh, rolling out new features. So if, if a particular experiment uh, needs features that are not available on the commercial solutions, then, then we can use this as well. Uh, this has been an active area of development for us, and we've demonstrated you know, fast reset and uh, crosstalk compensation and some other uh, features on this. Uh, and then at uh, the system integration level, at the, at the heart of that is uh, a framework we refer to as Qtrol uh, for quantum control. Um, and this really sits in between uh, the hardware and uh, the, the abstract circuits that, that users can submit. Um, you can generate the cir circuits from an, any number of uh, open uh, solutions. And then this gets transpiled into the native uh, native library of Qtrol, and then the Qtrol interfaces with the different um, different uh, control electronics to run the experiment. Um, and then we've been actually also working to integrate a number of uh, noise characterization and mitigation tools into this, and also we've been working with uh the part of our team or, or our collaborators in the computing sciences area at berkeley lab uh to integrate uh and take advantage of circuit optimization tools such as big skit and qsearch uh to uh, reduce the uh, the depth of circuits so that we can bring more complicated more complex experiments within the reach of our existing nisc hardware so just putting it all on the map, uh, this is roughly what it takes to, to uh, run all of this and to deploy this. Uh, a few different divisions here at Berkeley Lab. Uh, the, we've, been, we've been working with the Molecular Foundry to work on uh, to improve the material processes and, and increase our coherence times. The Accelerator Division is uh, the contributions to the FPGA controlled hardware development. Computing sciences area for uh, software tools, and uh, also this is where NERSC is. Um, and then uh, here to the left would be the campus where we have our fabrication uh, facilities and some of our measurement labs. Uh, so a little bit on uh, the user uh, on the implementation process for the user projects. Uh, applications, uh, as I mentioned, can be submitted. So this is the link. 
and this is again open to users from academia, industry, and national labs. Uh, the way the process works is once the uh, user proposal advances through the LOI uh, stage, so it's a letter of intent, it takes maybe like half an hour or an hour just to submit a simple LOI. Uh, then the next step after that is a full proposal uh, that's slightly more detailed, and then it makes its way through the review stages, internal and external. And at that point, points of contact are identified within the advanced quantum test bed uh, for each proposed project uh, based on interest and expertise and availability. And the points of contact coordinate uh, with the proposal PIs to set up introductory meetings and uh, to discuss the details of collaboration and feasibility and scope of the project. And typically what we find is that a deep collaboration is required between the two teams, between us and the proposing team, to really arrive at the right form of the project to be run. So we don't just simply execute uh, circuits. It's, it's really deeply collaborative, uh, which we find is really required um, to make things work with, uh, with existing uh, technologies. And then at that point, uh, uh, once the, the two teams agree and, and uh, feasibility is, is assessed, uh, you, you know, after making sure that the project's really aligned with the AQT mission and uh, leverage its unique capabilities. So in other words, it's, it's not just something that you can run on any cloud solution. It's, it has to be a little bit more complicated and, and require the deep expertise of uh, and the resources of the advanced quantum testbed and our personnel. Um, then at that point, uh, work starts and uh, it takes sometimes between six months to a year to run these projects. And uh, the two teams produce monthly updates that, that are reported to the US Department of Energy. Um, so uh, since we're here at NERSC I'm talking about quantum computing, a little bit of an analogy with the history of classical computing is, is useful. Um, in uh, you know, roughly about a century ago, as classical computing was getting started, it took us a while to really master the vacuum tube uh, systems. And by the 40s and 50s, people were packing vacuum tubes into uh, big rooms and, and creating large uh, classical computers that way. And uh, then decade by decade, slowly progress was made through the invention of the transistor and packing these transistors into integrated circuits and creating microprocessors out of them. And then, you know, half a century later, here we are and we have all this stuff in our phones. And uh, for perspective, it's really good to keep in mind that uh, in quantum computing, we're really in the vacuum tube uh, era. Um, and we really have to care about every single uh, detail of uh, how the systems work and, and every single qubit requires individual attention and every single experiment has to be crafted carefully. Um, so I find it helpful to keep this perspective in mind. Um, and uh, I think that's, I'll stop there. Uh, I have backup slides and other things. If people have questions, happy to answer them.